So, uh, thank you for letting me uh, speak here today. Uh, I will try to give uh, a preliminary overview of uh, my attempt to define a prehistoric landscape. Um, by analyzing the resource use within the landscape and the demarcations in and around it, I would like to show the diversity of uh, uh, a complex landscape uh, which uh, forms spatial occupation but is also formed by the inhabitants. And I think this duality is at the heart of trying to understand uh, the prehistoric landscapes uh, through the eyes of its inhabitants. Um, this also poses an opportunity to, inter to determine the interrelation of social dynamics and resource use. Uh, but I will only touch on this briefly because uh, I don't have so much time. Um, so the landscape uh, is here in Western Denmark. Uh, and uh, it's a densely populated landscape around uh, a river uh, called Storo. And uh, I am going to talk about this uh, area east of the small city Holstebro. Um, and uh, I have limited uh, my presentation today to the early Iron Age. Um, the area has been uh, surveyed extensively in connection with infrastructure and development projects. And right now, uh, the museum in Holstebro is uh, working on a larger research project uh, focusing on settlement and land use in this area from the late Neolithic and onto the beginning of the 20th century. And this is just uh, the preliminary uh, results. So I hope we'll have much more to share at a later date. But first, let's take a look at the landscape in its natural form. Uh, the area is located at the edge of the Vaxillian ice sheet, so uh, that has created a unique range of natural resources associated with both the clay forehills to the north, you can see uh, the landscape up there, and the river valley to the south, which is uh, more flat and sandy. Uh, some of the natural features of the landscape uh, which uh, must have been characteristics in the Iron Age as well, are uh, still evident today, such as the, as the river and uh, the small streams, uh, and the stark contrast between the flat sandy plains and the hills to the north. Uh, but other features are less obvious, uh, such as the small box containing bog iron, uh, which seem to have featured heavily in the northern part of the area. Today, these small bogs are drained and uh, they're clearly visible in historical maps uh, of the area. And other features are entirely hidden uh, from our understanding, such as which areas have been forested uh, or maybe prehistoric sources of fresh water have uh, been obscured by modern drainage. During the late Neolithic and the Bronze Age, the natural demarcations were supplemented uh, by several hundred burial mounds, forming a line parallel to the river. Um, the mounds are linked to the main travel and transportation route, which is simply known as the ancient route, also Svein in Danish. Uh, and this route stretches uh, almost 90 kilometers inland from the western coast. It's not, it's not a road as such, it's just uh, a transportation route. Um, but during the early Iron Age, four pit zone alignments were constructed, two in Myopia and uh, two in the neighboring parish of Borbia. The pit zone alignments uh, consist of several hundred small shallow pits stuck in rows and stretching uh, more than two kilometers, <laughs> the longest ones, across the landscape. Some of them are divided into sections and some have rows of post holes along one side. Um, you can see the pits here and the row, rows of post holes dispersed on this side. Um, when the pit zone alignments were first discovered, they were compared to uh, Cheveux de Fries or to Caesar's lilies. Um, but the pit zone alignments in, my, in the Myrob area contain no evidence of spikes or other objects being placed in or between the pits. So the most plausible interpretation for these uh, particular uh, alignments is that they are simply long rows of small empty pits and they might have been a temporary hindrance for a group intent on crossing them uh, but I think it's doubtful if they are a substantial defense. Um, while the mounds are still visible in the landscape today the pits were never redug 
they must have sanded over within a few years. So it's each of the four pit zone alignments represent a very specific but unknown event. Uh, also in the early Iron Age, a system of uh, fields uh, were laid out just north of the row of mounds. And together, these man-made and natural demarcations have shaped the landscape, adding a valuable aspect to understanding the sites within the area. Um, in addition to the fields, the pit zones, and the mounds, we have archaeological evidence in the form of eight excavated settlement sites in Myrop from this period. Six of the sites are only partially excavated, uh, with only a few houses on each site, because this is primarily uh, rescue excavations, uh, so we don't always get the full picture. But the fully excavated sites are Luan uh, and uh, Langemagen. Uh, in Luan, there is only one house, and in Twis Mølleveg, one or two houses, and then Langemagen, which has approximately 100 houses dating from between 500 and 300 BC. Uh, and this is the Langemagen site. Um, as you can see, the light blue is the pre-Roman uh, settlement, and there are other periods here as well. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Damn. The houses at Langemagen are not fenced, uh, and it's not always possible to determine if a house is a main building or a secondary building, but since most of the houses have both living areas and buyers, each house is assumed to represent an independent farm. Uh, at the moment, we're not entirely sure how many houses may have been functioning at the same time. Generally, the uh, 14, C14 dates fall within the range of uh, 500 to 300 BC, but it's a difficult period for uh, carbon dating because of the Hallstatt Plateau, so we can't really get any closer than that right now. Um, but if it's assumed that a farm has been in use for approximately one generation or 30 years, then that would mean 15 farms were in use at any given time during that period. And this is, of course, very simplified, but it might be a general indication of the intensity of the settlement. Uh, some of the farms seem to have been located in the same spot for several settlement phases, and others seem to have migrated a bit more, or simply have a later starting date or an earlier end date. So, we have a settlement structure consisting of a large, fairly stable settlement, and several smaller settlements with shorter time spans surrounding it. And that's not really a part of the usual settlement pattern for this time and place but it may indicate a transition from the late Bronze Age settlement structure of dispersed single or double farmsteads to the hamlet or village-like settlements of the Middle and Late Pre-Roman Iron Age. The oldest phases of the Celtic fields uh, are thought to be dating to the same time as the settlement at Langemagen. Uh, they are a symptom of the same change in access to resources from a dispersed settlement with fields uh, connected to each farm and to a nucleated settlement with a larger coherent arable area consisting of smaller plots or fields surrounded by earthen banks. There are only limited traces of iron smelting at Langemagen and the surrounding sites, but at a contemporary site nearby, uh, we have evidence of extensive smelting and iron working dating back to the very beginning of the pre-Roman Iron Age. This site, Mopia, is situated a little further north in the clay hills, and the smelting site is located at the edge of a peat bog containing bog ore. So iron working might not have been present in large quantity at the Langemagen site and the surrounding area, but presumably it was quite easy to obtain iron tools from the neighboring settlement just three or four kilometers away. So iron might represent a resource where access was limited, but not by the occurrence of bog iron as a raw material but maybe more by the relatively new set of skills needed to work with bog iron ore into tools. As mentioned, the demarcations add an aspect of understanding to the settlement structure, but what about the demarcations themselves? Who built them? Uh, most of the mounds were built during the Bronze Age. Rows of mounds are common throughout the area, and they seem to be an integrated part of the Bronze Age cosmology. At this point, the settlement pattern, pattern consisted of single farmsteads. Thus, the construction of this particular row of mounds spanning 
90 kilometers must have been the result of a common understanding of the right way to place a mount in the landscape. But the pit zones were dug during the early Iron Age, when the settlement and land use patterns were transforming. The pit zones in the Maibob area are all located near the Old Bronze Age transportation route. Two are running parallel to the old road. Um, this one and this one. And uh, one crosses it from here. And the last small blue line is not, uh, we're not able to uh, determine the, the direction it takes yet. Of the three pit zones with determinable directions, they are all associated with the river crossings. The westernmost pit zone uh, at Swiss Müllewei is running across the ancient road. <coughs> its southern end is located just north of the river crossing at Storbrook down here. Um, and uh, this pit zone has two smaller openings allowing pedestrian traffic through, but preventing, for example, wagons, riders, or herds of cattle from crossing. You can see that one of the openings over there is only just <coughs> approximately one meter um, across. The pit zone at uh, Rizum Östergård, further east, is running parallel to the ancient road, with the western end located just uh, east of the river crossing at Stor uh, Yeah. Down there. And then the, nor the northeastern end of the pit zone at Lilletaustrup sits at the edge of the crossing at Gammelbybæk. And all three crossings are marked by several sunken roads in the river banks. Uh, sunken roads in this area date back to the Bronze Age, so it's not at all implausible that the crossings have been in use when the pit zones were dug. So, the pit zones seem to point towards the river crossings. They were dug at a time when the settlement structure was changing from dispersed single farms to, la to a larger, more coherent settlement, thus redefining the landscape as seen by its inhabitants. And this changing use of the landscape called the old conventions of access in the landscapes and routes through the area into question. So as we've established, <laughs> sorry, as we've established the pit zones are connected to the river crossings. So the questions become, were they meant to confirm the old travel routes marked by the row of mounds? Or were they an effort to renegotiate or transform them to be a part of the resource assemblage associated with the new spatial organization of the landscape? If we look at it through the lens of simple transportation, the old route, the old road loosely marked by the row of mounds winding through a dispersed settlement was not easy to control when settlement became more centralized. The new spatial organization necessitated a more tightly regulated route, ensuring that traffic went through the appropriate channels, bringing it close by the settlement and thereby ensuring access to the resources brought by the flow of people, be it access to traded goods, news, or the ability to control who passed <coughs> through the area. But looking at the problem from a more immaterial and social anthropological viewpoint, controlling the flow of people might not be just about securing access to resources. It might also be about social coherence and consolidating the new way of organizing space. However, in my experience, things are rarely so clean cut. Most of the time, archaeological Archaeological phenomena are both practical and social in nature. Digging the long rows of pits must have been a considerable effort for a small farming community like the one at Langemagen. It must have been quite a social event, even if the purpose was practical in nature. Which brings us back to the duality where the landscapes both form and is formed by the inhabitants. The landscape shaped the way people moved through it. The easiest places to cross rivers and streams became focal points. At the same time, the trade and communication routes formed the way the inhabitants used the resources available to them, be it iron trade, cattle herding, or other activities. So by repeating these activities through time, the people formed the landscape, confirming the routes and focal points by wearing sunken roads into the hills to the point where the old crossings are still used today, 2,500 years after the pit zones were constructed. And that's all I have to say today, if you want to read a bit more, I have some inspiration here. Thank you very much. Thank you.